Well, welcome everybody to all of our campuses, meeting throughout the Twin Cities today. The good news in the Twin Cities is that it's springtime, I think, but there's still ice on the lakes, but turkey season is here, so uh, there's hope. I also want to welcome those of you watching online around the country and world who could care less about turkey season, but glad you could join us as well today. We are in a series called Seven Words to Change Your Life, and so far it's been yes, no, thanks, and today's word is help. Such a simple little word that has great power. I've helped a few people in my life, but I have been the recipient of so much help from so many people, uh, I really can't take credit for much of anything. For example, I hit the lottery with a mom and dad who loved each other, loved God, loved us five kids, and that gave us kids a head start that a lot of kids don't get in life. And by the way, if you didn't get that with great parents, at least you have an excuse. You know, I have no excuse for turning out. Uh, if I didn't turn out, then it'd be a problem, and maybe I haven't turned out as well as I should have. But my dad was a respected pastor and leader in our city. No kidding, everywhere I would go, people would come up to me and say, are you Cal Merritt's son? Is Barb your mom? And they'd say it like, do you realize how fortunate you are? And I began to think, man, I better not screw this up. Then all through high school, college, and grad school, I had coaches and teachers who mentored and challenged me when I was barely just hanging on during our three years at Penn State University. I had a Christian classmate who took me under his wing. There was a a Christian family in our church who basically took us in and cared for us. Had an English professor there who taught me how to write. Almost by accident, I took this course as an elective, but Bob Gannon really taught me uh, how to write uh, messages even today. Uh, During the past 27 years, countless people in this church have helped me in so many ways, and there's a few people in this church who I owe my life to, and you know who you are. The list of teachers, authors, staff, board members, family, and friends who've helped me in my life goes on and on and on. So one of the questions I want to explore with all of you today is who is helping you? Who is advising and helping you become a better person? If you're like nobody, In fact, I'm a self-made guy. I'm a self-made gal. You will fall short of your potential. A lot of that is pride. It's arrogance. I'm just my own person, and I don't need anybody. And I'm telling you, if you don't need anybody and you've kind of isolated yourself, you will fall short of your potential. Honestly, I need help with something every single day, but I'm not alone. Uh, I'm a huge basketball fan, grew up playing, and it's always been my favorite sport. So when I got invited to the Saturday night game, last Saturday night, to the Timberwolves' first home playoff game in 14 years, I was beside myself with excitement. I hadn't been to a game in eight years, mainly because I'm in bed by the third quarter. But I had a second row seat to watch the Wolves take on James Harden and the Houston Rockets, and the atmosphere was absolutely electric. I was waving my, you know, towel and fist pumping the air like a little kid. I even high-fived the 70-year-old lady next to me. She was a total stranger, thought I was, who who knows what she thought, which is why I was so embarrassed when this picture wound up on the front page of the Star Tribune online. Have you seen this picture? (laughs) Some of you have who are following sports, but here's a group of people who clearly need some help. Now, ignore me for a minute. But look at this guy, okay? He supposedly uh, found out he works for Adidas, but he's got a man purse. I mean, come on. Who brings a man purse to a game? Clearly, he needs help. These two guys should be in anger management. They obviously need help. This lady's calling for another cocktail, and, you know, she, she needs help, and James Harden, this year's probable MVP, dated Khloe Kardashian. I mean, if that's not a cry for help, I don't know what is. And what's with his beard? Birds could be nesting in that thing. And the lady in yellow, here's a classic overreactor. Okay, overreacts to everything on the planet. Clearly, she needs help. But then, there's this guy. The best player on the planet is three feet away from me, but I'm looking for the hot dog man. (laughs) My word isn't help, it's oblivious, seriously. When my kids saw this picture, they said, Dad, what's wrong with you? 
The next day, social media just went nuts. One of our video guy was tracking all this and he texted me, he said, Bob, it's had over a million, mi a million hits. I told the guy who I was with as we walked into the arena that night, I said, look, sometimes I go to these things just because I'm looking for sermon material. <laughs> but not like that. Uh, one guy tweeted, this is like the Renaissance painting, a painting from the Renaissance, and I'm telling you, that's all it took. The Renaissance theme took off <laughs> on social media, and now, you know, I'm in the Last Supper of all things, or <laughs> it's just unbelievable what's happened. Now, <laughs> Reddit Reddit is a worldwide website that tracks trending news. So Reddit, people started writing in from all over the world. One guy wrote this, what's the blue shirt guy looking at? <laughs> Another guy jumps in, it looks like he just saw the ice cold beer man coming his way and he cares more about that than anything else. <laughs> so then someone came to my rescue. That's Bob Merritt. <laughs> This is so embarrassing. <laughs> He's a pastor in the Twin Cities, probably not that interested in sports, probably thinking about Jesus. I mean, come on. <laughs> All that's bad enough, but then a national website called High Top Athletics wrote this about me. Hey, buddy. <laughs> James Harden's literally right next to you. Also, by the direction everybody else is looking, the actual game is taking place in the opposite direction of where you're gazing. He says, what could possibly have consumed this dude's attention? <laughs> so much so that he's not only ignoring the game he paid to watch, but also the biggest star in said game is right in front of him. He looks like he's checking the clock at his son's karate class. <laughs> and on and on it went. I could care less about karate, by the way. So just so you know that, whoever wrote that. <laughs> and for the record, I love sports. I love Jesus, but I love sports. And I was actually, I was actually looking at the referee and James Butler, as he was making his call, James Harden was out of the play. I was the only one paying attention to the game. <laughs> also, for the record, I have never been that close to a game. A friend of mine uh, let me have his wife's seat, and he, he had to deal with that later on, but I, it was beyond amazing. It just was incredible. But I need help. We all need help, everyone in that picture needs help. Here's the problem. Not all of us know that we need help. We all need help. Solomon was considered to be the wisest and most successful man in the ancient world. James Harden's on the top of the NBA, but Solomon was on top of the world. Solomon was King David's son, just about to become king. He had position, power, wealth. Look what Solomon says about needing help. Got to wipe the tears away from my eyes. He says, two are better than one. For all of his wealth and power, he wasn't arrogant about this. He admitted, two are better than one. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But man, pity the person who falls and has nobody there to help him up. Solomon admitted his need for help. Two are better than one. No matter how smart, strong, or good you are, there will be times when all of us need help. He says, look, pity the person who falls. Gang, we're all gonna fall. Not just once, many times throughout our lives, and often you won't see it coming. It'll, it'll blindside you. You'll be sitting in the second row, and all of a sudden you're, you're the laughing stock of a million people around the globe. It'll just hit you. You'll be doing fine in school, just skating along. But suddenly you get sick or overwhelmed or left out. Your career's on track, but then you get passed over or let go. Your health is good, but then out of the blue, something shows up in your blood work. 
and you're headed for a long, hard road. Your family seems good, but then your son starts over drinking. Or your daughter brings home a guy who's got bad character. Isn't it true some of you parents are here today and I feel, I feel heavy for you. My heart is heavy. Some of you have a son or daughter right now who's in trouble and you've tried everything in your own power to turn that situation around, but maybe the one thing you haven't really tried is this single word. Help. We need help. Help us. Solomon says, pity the person who falls and has nobody to help him up. So in the time we have left, I want to explore two questions with you. Who's helping you? And then who are you helping? Because it's not just about receiving help. I mean, your purpose on this planet is to make a difference in somebody else's life. So who's helping you? But then who are you helping in this world? So who's helping you? The same guy, Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes, also wrote the book of Proverbs. You ought to see the book of Proverbs in my Bible. It's marked up. There's notes all over in my Bible because I have lived my life based on the book of Proverbs. It's a tremendous book. We ought to read the Proverbs every single day. And the Psalms and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just go on. I mean, you ought to read the Bible every single day, but especially some of these books like the Proverbs. Look what look Solomon says in the book of Proverbs. He says, look, things go wrong for lack of advice but many advisors, so key, many advisors bring success. Why do we need advisors? Because there are people who have wisdom and experience that we need. You and I need the wisdom and experience that other people have, and their advice can help us succeed or avoid disaster. I can almost guarantee that in every area in your life, whether it's in marriage, parenting, work, finances, decision-making, or health, someone is ahead of you. Someone is doing it better than you, better than me, and they could help us become successful in those areas. So I want to ask you, who is ahead of you? Who could you gain advice from who is doing it better, has more experience than you or me? Who's ahead of you in your marriage? Who's got a marriage? And every time you look at their marriage, you think, I wish we had that. I wish what we had, what, what they have. Man, if you know somebody like that, ask them for advice. Why not ask them to coffee or join a marriage support group? Why not contact one of our pastors? We have over 100 pastors who could help you in this area of solving marriage issues. Why not go to counseling and get some advice before you're in trouble? Many advisors, Solomon says, wisest man on the planet at that time. Many advisors bring success. Three tips about advisors, though. Make sure your advisors, number one, are competent. Both times I took financial advice from my brother, I lost money. <laughs> you should never take financial advice from your brother, uncle, or some random guy at Applebee's unless they are in the financial industry and have a proven, proven track record. Make sure they're competent. Second, don't wait until your marriage, career, or kids are in the tank and it's too late. Biggest mistake people make is they wait until they hit absolute rock bottom and oftentimes it's too late to turn it around. We see this all the time. You know, for example, an eight-year-old kid is completely out of control, but what do parents often do? Nothing. They say, it's just a phase. Gang, I'm telling you, it's not a phase. That kid is going to turn into a teenage nightmare. If he's out of control or she's out of control at age eight, who will tear their house and life apart unless those parents get some advice and bring appropriate boundaries and discipline to that child. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's just a phase and they're going to grow out of it. They won't. It'll get worse. Parents. Don't wait. There's many families in our church, by the way, who are just amazing parents. And they're raising kids who are respectful, kind, faith-filled, hard-working kids, not entitled. Vince and Julie Lutz are an example of this. They've raised eight wonderful kids. Maybe it's nine now. I can't keep track. So every time I see them, he's my mechanic. He's just amazing. Every time I see him, I say, how do you do it? 
and they give me free advice. You don't have to pay for advice. Just find someone who has eight kids and ask them. You know, just drill them. Hey, how do you do this? Make sure your advisors are competent. Don't wait until the problem is beyond help. And finally, Solomon says, get many. Get many counselors because no matter how wise or competent someone is as, a, as an advisor, he or she has blind spots and biases that skew their advice. Doesn't matter who it is. Maybe their advice is 95% right, and so you begin to trust that person implicitly, but the 5% where they're wrong can really hurt you. So key. It can be a person on your board, staff, or small group. That person can be very, very competent in most areas in life, but if he or she is your only advisor and you're not getting other advice from other people who can balance their advice out, the 5% where that person is wrong can absolutely tank you. That's why Solomon says, get many advisors. I have a board of seven wise, wise, wise people to advise me, an executive team of four wise people and multiple advisors at every area in my life because many, many advisors bring success. But when it comes to getting help, it's not just advice we need, is it? You know, sometimes we just need somebody to be there for us. I don't know about you, but I get discouraged a lot. I get discouraged. My courage leaks. And I need to be encouraged. And sometimes I don't need advice. What I need most is just someone just to be there for me, remind me that they're for me. Got a big, long text from my mom last night and then another long one this morning, and she's like 87 and takes her forever to write a text, but she's just for me. Calls me her little boy. Still, my mom, she's there. In the book of Job, he lost everything, everything. He was a very wealthy man, but he lost his family, his health, his home, his wealth. So three of Job's friends came to visit him. And I want you to see in Job 2.12 what it says. When Job's friends saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and tore their robes. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. Ever sat with someone for seven days and not say a word? I haven't. Seven minutes, maybe. But Job's friends sat with him for seven days and seven nights in silence. Think of the sacrifice that was for these three friends. You talk about love. Love is costly. Love will sacrifice and these three friends came to Job's aid, came to Job's side, and said, We will sit here for seven days and not say a word if that's what it takes. I have a few friends like that. Bill Butters is one of them. I get a text once a week from Bill saying, Bob, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad we're friends. And then before I speak on a big weekend, Bill will text me and he'll say, Bob, give him heaven. <laughs> he doesn't say the other one. Give him heaven. Bill's been a loyal friend for 27 years. Played in the NHL for a number of years, but now he leads hundreds of kids to Christ through hockey ministries. And several years ago, we decided to take a bike ride to Forest Lake and back, which is about a 30-mile run. And I was worried because Bill is a biker and he is very strong. And I didn't know if I'd be able to keep up with him. And I stayed with him for a few miles, but I knew I couldn't sustain that pace. And I thought, how can we do this so Bill gets his workout and I don't just die? <laughs> it was a very risky move. And I didn't know how Bill would react, but I reached over and I grabbed hold of his shorts so he could pull me along. And you know what he did? He turned to me and he said, that's okay. That's what my wife Debbie does. when we rollerblade together. <laughs> he didn't call me a wimp. He didn't give me advice on biking techniques. 
He just pulled me along until I could regain my strength. Do you have anybody like that? Who will just pull you along until you can regain your strength? Two are better than one. When one falls down, the other can help them up. But now, gang, I want to ask you another question, and this is so important. Who are you helping? Who's depending on you? So key. Who's depending on you to pull them along? To set an example of what it means to follow Christ. To set an example of what it means to love your spouse. To set an example to be strong in character. Who is depending on you to pull them along? Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In order to sharpen somebody else, you have to be sharp yourself. You have to be as strong as iron yourself is such a key question. Are you strong in your faith and in your character and your wisdom, or are you always in the ditch and unable to help anybody? Are you strong? Are you working on your character? A few years ago, I was in a really bad situation. Uh, I was hunting sheep in Alaska, once in a lifetime kind of thing. Our guides had spotted a ram across the valley, four miles across the valley on a mountain ridge, but in order to get there, we had to cross a river. The Yannert River, which concerned me, but when you're with guides, you figure they know what they're doing. So after breakfast, we saddled up four horses for our two guides and my brother and myself, and we left camp single file. 57-year-old Monty was the lead guy. 21-year-old Colton was the uh, second guide. It was a crystal clear morning, beautiful as we, as our horses took us through this bog and uh, black spruce trees. It was so beautiful, we just took it in. But then a half hour later, we broke through the trees, and there was this Yannert River. Again, scared me. The Yannert is a quarter mile wide in most places. It's a glacial li- river that has ice cold water, silty water. You can't see the bottom. Unpredictable currents, deep holes, and suddenly the guides got real serious. The lead guide, Monty, spun around and he yelled to my brother and me, if your horse gets into a deep current, whatever you do, stay on your horse. That's all the instruction we got. I mean, we were rookies. We didn't know what we were doing. So Monty's horse dropped into the river and it was very freaky. I mean, four horses in a row going across this river with John and me in the back. Soon the water came up over my boots, came up over my saddle. About halfway across, Monty dropped into a deep hole and we watched him get swept off his saddle in fast current. Suddenly, he and his horse were in very big trouble. The current was swift, so strong and deep, they could not get out. And I could see the fear in Monty's eyes. He had seconds to get out of this situation or he was gonna die. Colton, the 21-year-old kid from Cody, Wyoming, had actually taken a different route through the river. He'd already made it out and was waiting on, on a sandbar for the rest of us. Tough kid, scar on his face, wore a sweaty old cowboy hat, just happened to be a champion wrangler. Didn't know this. Monty let out a desperate, guttural call for help. Colton jumped off his horse, coiled a rope, and fired it 30 yards at Monty, hit him right in the chest. Monty grabbed that rope, and Colton mounted his horse from the backside, wrapped the rope around his saddle horn, kicked his horse, and dragged Monty into shallow water. Monty was hanging on to the reins of his horse this way, to the rope of his other hand, just stretched out like this and just being dragged out of that current. And that 21-year-old kid saved Monty's life that day. <sighs> Meanwhile, <laughs> my brother and I were watching this. And we're next. John leaned over and said, well, that wasn't in the brochure. (laughs) We somehow made it across. But gang, here's my point, and this is so important. That 21-year-old kid, since the time he was five years old, 
was riding horses, throwing ropes, chasing down cattle in rodeos. 16 years of preparing and sharpening his skills for a single moment that saved a man's life. Here's my question to all of you. What are you doing to prepare yourself? What are you doing to sharpening your skills as a parent, as a leader, as a student, what are you doing to prepare yourself and sharpen your skills so that you will be ready for the moment or moments in life when somebody else is gonna need you? Are you living your life in such a way that you're gonna be ready? Are you preparing yourself in God's word? Look at what the Bible says about God's word. All scripture, every bit of it is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, correcting, training in righteousness so that, love this, so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped, here it is, for every good work. The Bible gang is here to equip us. It's useful for every kind of training in this world. So are you reading it? Are you paying attention to it? Those of you who are in church today, way to go. Those of you who are watching online, you're listening to God's word being taught, way to go. That's a start. Get into it every single day so that you will be ready and equipped. Are you doing that? Are you training yourself, preparing yourself in biblical truth so that you will be ready to throw a rope to your son when he needs it? Or throw a rope to your daughter or your spouse or your family or friend or colleague at work? Are you reading books that are sharpening your parenting skills? Do you seek advice when your marriage gets a little wobbly? Are you listening to great teaching online and reading God's word every day? Are you preparing and training yourself so when that moment comes when somebody needs you, you can throw them a rope and save their life? By the way, some of you have come out of a background of addiction and you've recovered Someone threw a rope to you. Here's what I want to say to you. Use that background to throw a rope to somebody else who's now struggling. Some of you have come through a divorce and you are helped in recovery. Use that background to throw a rope to somebody else who is struggling and gone, gone through divorce. Some of you have lost a job but got help through that or you lost a child, health, or your spouse, if someone threw a rope and saved you in that moment, will you do the same for somebody else? Gang, who's helping you? And who are you helping? Are you preparing yourself for the moment or moments when somebody is gonna need you to be strong? Final word. There is a help that only comes from God. I know the Bible says it this way. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And as we close our time today, you know, some of you are trying to do life all on your own without God's consistent, daily, loving help. God waits every morning when we get up to put our trust in him, to breathe a little prayer. God, will you be with me? Will you strengthen me? Will you guide me? And some of us just blow past that and dive into the day. God is the source of my help. Every single day. Gang, the God who knows you, loves you, and created you, the God who is powerful enough to make the heavens and the earth is powerful enough to help you no matter what you're going through. Some of you are facing an impossible situation, it seems to you, but it's not impossible to God. You know, so often when I face a really hard challenge, I try to solve that thing all on my own, so I work harder, I run faster, I exhaust all my resources to try to solve that thing all, my, all on my own. But maybe the most important thing for me to do and for you to do is just stop and pray a single prayer. Lord, help me. Help me. So to all our camp campuses today and watching online, where do you need help? Where do you need help? If you're like, man, I don't need help. I'm my own person. That's arrogance. And you'll fall short. Have a humble spirit an open spirit. 
We all need help. I have blind spots I need help with, so maybe maybe some of your prayer today is, Lord, help me with my kids. Or, Lord, help me with my loneliness. Lord, help me with my jealousy over other people's kids, other people's job. God, I get so jealous of what other people make. Help me with that. I get envious of other people's appearance, their position. God, help me be thankful for everything you've given me. Lord, help me with my fear, with my anxiety. Help me with my anger. God, help me. I lift my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you trust him? Do you know him? Do you go to him every day? He is our helper and our strength. So at all campuses, I just want to invite you to stand real quietly as we close in prayer together. And as you stand and as you watch online, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And it's going to be a prayer of help. And so if you just bow with me, and you can fill in the blank wherever your life is at, wherever you need help, just fill in the blank and ask God to help you. So God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the advisors in our lives, the people who have helped us. God, I pray that we would then also recognize that it's not just about receiving help, being dependent but God, I pray that all of us would be careful how we live and build our character and faith and our marriage and our lives, our relationships, so that we can be strong enough to throw a rope and help somebody else. So where do you need help today? Pray this prayer. God, I need help. Fill in the blank. Lord, help me with What is it for you? God, as we stand quietly before you and thousands of prayers are going up before you, I just pray that by your power and strength and love, you will answer these prayers and give us your help. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for coming out.